Chapter 4 is entitled Molecular Compounds. So we are finally going to get into bonding. We've been exposed to a lot of things, the, the periodic table, just in a nutshell, what electrons are doing, quantum numbers, and then periodic trends. But now we're going to look at, uh, at the building blocks and the different kinds of compounds. And so this chapter introduces the di two different types of bonding, ionic and covalent and then focuses on covalent which are molecular compounds and so they are really there's an infinite number of possibilities how to combine these these atoms especially when it comes to to covalent compounds and so organic compounds which are covalent compounds for example and there's a two semester chemistry uh, sequence for undergraduate chemistry and biology majors that you will be taking probably uh, deals exclusively with carbon and so carbon along with, with hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, oxygen and then to some extent sulfur and some other element but, th but these are the main ones that deal with uh, uh, covalent compounds and so you can really you can really have an infinite almost an infinite number of, of, of compounds put together combine them and but you have to follow certain rules and this is what we're we're about to about to experience right and so really the book states that there are 91 elements on the periodic table that are used in bonding and and, and some of the other ones are uh, uh, the ones beyond 91 are are all definitely radioactive so we're talking about uranium and beyond uh, but there, are, there it's even fewer than that because there, there are some that are below that that are also radioactive and are not uh, used. Okay, so in a nutshell, we have the dividing line. If you remember, <laughs> it's not exactly the periodic table here, but you get you, you, you remember. We've got the metals on the left and the nonmetals on the right. And if you have a metal and a nonmetal, you get an ionic compound. And if you have two nonmetals or more making bonds combining you have a covalent compound okay so this is a summary here and what happens is the metal and if you remember back to the last chapter we there are two things going on first of all electronegativity the ability of an element to draw electron density towards it right so the metals are the opposite of electronegative they're electropositive a lot of them only have one or two electrons in their outer shell so they want to get rid of those electrons and the nonmetals which are on on the right of the periodic table they have a lot of valence electrons and so they're closer to the noble gas uh, at least in an ex uh, to an extent where they could just pick up an electron or two to become noble gas like where for a metal it's easier to give up an electron so what happens is the metals will will uh, give up their electrons and transfer them to the nonmetal and so you get so-called ions you get cations and anions cations are positively charged particles and anions are negatively charged particles and that's how they bond and then you, you and I have that in, uh, nice pictures in a minute here. And this chapter focuses on molecular compound or covalent compounds. If nonmetals bind to each other or interact with each other to make organic compounds, or and and that includes DNA and enzymes and signaling compounds and insulin and and all those all those compounds, glucose, all of food, everything uh, basically is a covalent compound or molecular compound. So if you have two nonmetals that are that are bonding together, they're both electronegative. They don't want to give up their electron density. So what happens there is they share, and so that's that's the focus of of uh, of this chapter. Electronegativity mentioned it already. This is bringing back the trend from chapter three: ability of an element to draw electron density towards it. Right. So I have that totally rehearsed, but I understand it, and you should also understand it. Right. So fluorine has the highest electronegativity. Fluorine is is one away from being neon. Neon. See, neon is out here. Neon doesn't have an electronegativity. It has a full valence shell. Uh, the, the entire second period is full and so therefore it's inert it doesn't react that's why it's called a noble gas it's not polar it's white as a gas and and so fluorine is just one away from being 
neon. So it just has to pick up one electron. And so its affinity to, to, to want that electron is very high. Okay, so it's not called affinity, but it's called electronegativity, right? So, and it makes sense that it would drop when you go away within a group. You're still chlorine still has one uh, is only one away from the next noble gas, which is argon, and it should it it is electronegative. But there are more electrons that shield the nucleus from pulling on that electron from 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 wanting that, right? So fluorine only has the two, and then uh, I wish that thing would stop glitching, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so you've got that pull, and so the next shell for chlorine, so if chlorine then has, of course, eight here, those electrons in the first and the second shell, they shield that nucleus from pulling, but it's still pretty strong here, right? So it, uh, it's still highly electronegative. All right, so fluorine is the most electronegative, and then as you get away from it, it, it decreases. Therefore, you have that decrease within a group, and you have an increase within a period. All right, so the, the less metallic something is, you start up with, with metals here, lithium, with a very low electronegativity, so we even refer to them as electropositive. They want to get rid of its electron density. So, so it makes sense that, that a nonmetal and a metal will, will simply be a electron transfer, okay? And so this is from your book, figure 5.3, page 207. So this comes actually from, from chapter 5. That's why I pointed out. But uh, electron activity was brought up already. And so what, what happens is there's a... There's a uh, if the electronegativity, the difference between two elements is, is high, then we have a purely ionic compound, right? So if the, the difference here, if chi is electronegativity, if the, the difference in electronegativity is larger than two, it's purely ionic, right? And then if it's less than one, it's purely covalent. But if it's if it's in between, it's, it's also covalent, but it's called polar covalent, okay? If it's in between, it's polar covalent. And I'll explain what that means here in a minute. Okay. First of all, I forgot to mention again, I'll point out that this hydrogen here, you need to remember that its electronegativity falls between boron and carbon. The, uh, and so the difference between carbon and hydrogen, for example, is less than 1. It's 0 0.1. So this is purely covalent. It's, it's a nonpolar covalent compound, carbon and hydrogen, right? So it might be deceptive because hydrogen on the periodic table is on the left, listed with the metals, but it's not. It's a non-metal. It has a very high electronegativity. It's just special because it, there are only two electrons in the first shell for that noble gas, helium. So it's just an oddball, but it does engage in covalent bonding mainly, right? And so then if you look at a compound between carbon and oxygen, you now have a difference of 1.0. So you're right on the border there. So you have something that's a, it's covalent, but it's starting to, to increase in ionic character. Not, not quite yet, right? So if you have a, a compound between, let's say, a boron and, uh, let's make it carbon and fluorine, now you're going gonna to have some ionic character. And some ionic character, uh, if it's less than 2, right, if the difference is less than 2, it refers to polarity of a compound, okay? All right, I'll bring the polarity back. For now, just understand metals and nonmetals make ionic compounds, nonmetals and nonmetals make covalent compounds, and then there are there's a, a, a an ionic character depending on how big the difference in electronegativity is. It, it essentially means that if you have something like fluorine, let's make a fluorine and carbon bond here, right? So fluorine has an electronegativity of 4.0, carbon has one of 2.1. They're not going to be sharing this equally here, right? The electron density will not be shared equally. Whereas if you have hydrogen and carbon, the difference is 0 0.4 there's a you know it's an insignificant difference in polarity right 
but but this is going to have uh, more electron density pulled towards the fluorine. The fluorine just pulls on that stronger, so it's not an even electron cloud. More clear cut is is hydrogen, right? They both have the same electron negativity. The electron cloud is going to be a perfect sphere where electron density is distributed perfectly even, whereas here you have more of this skewed, right? You've got more electron density towards fluorine. And that makes it polar. That makes that creates a partial, not a real, but a partial negative charge, right? So this is almost on the ionic uh, side anyway. Uh, carbon is not 2.1, it's, it's 2.5. Okay, so it's it's highly it has a very polar it's a very polar compound, and so uh, for ionic compounds, uh, it is interesting to note that the property of the element changes completely when it engages in bonding. Okay, sodium is a a soft metal. This is shown here on the left, sodium as a solid is is. A soft metal, you, you can actually cut it with a knife. I have some in the lab. I use it to for, for my solvents in my research to dry them. And uh, it is highly reactive, okay? it uh, If you put it in water, it will instantly react with water to form sodium hydroxide and, and uh, a, so, a sodium chloride. So it's... it's uh, for, it's instantly going to change from a metal to an ion. It's going to give up that electron. It is highly electropositive. It wants to give that up. So this is this is uh, explosive, uh, flammable, and highly reactive. And chlorine gas, which is diatomic, first of all, is in the gaseous stage. Is also it's a poisonous gas. Okay, and it has a boiling point of negative 34 degrees Celsius. This has a boiling point of 98 degrees. Celsius. So that's sorry, that's the melting point. So which is pretty low for for a metal, okay? And when those two combine, we get sodium chloride, which is table salt and we we uh, probably use it daily. There's a lot of food that we eat has salt on it and we we sometimes when we buy french fries, some of us put some more salt on there, right? And so now this compound is is not dangerous. It's not explosive. It's uh, you grind it up into a salt and I mean it is a salt and so it melts at 801 degrees so just looking at not just chemical properties also melting point it's it does change drastically now this is the boiling point here okay so keep that in mind and and so also uh, I have these this is a chemical reaction we haven't been exposed to those yet but uh, we have an, um, we have phase labels here, and I'll bring those back up. But they just simply indicate what what phase they're in. You know, already know we have solid, liquid, and gas. And so solid S here is a solid, G is a gas, and and uh, and this is also a solid. And so sometimes, and these are interchange. Sometimes we use different phase labels, right? So you might might see NaCl aqueous. Okay, that's no longer solid. That's dissolved in water now. Ionic solids dissolve in water. Polar, uh, uh, well, ionic solids dissolve in polar solvents. Okay, all right, so I already mentioned polar, and since I said polar solvent, here, see, here is water. The difference in electronegativity is rather large, so it has an ionic character. It's a covalent bond, and so you have this partial negative and partial positive charge. Right, and if you remember here, the electron was transferred, so you have a plus and a minus in sodium chloride. It is that cation that'll interact with the partial negative on the water, and it's the anion that'll interact with the partial positive of the water. And so you can actually take rip this apart when you add this into water. And if that's the case, we use the face label AQ. Okay. Looking at the electronic configuration to make more sense out of what's happening here, right? So you should know this by now. Chapter 3 extensively covered electronic configurations. Uh, so sodium has one valence electron. It has, and we left out the, the neon uh, configuration, right? So this would have neon. It only focuses on, on the valence electrons, right? So it has one valence electron, chlorine. Chlorine is also a neon, 3s2, 3p5, right? And so, so it, it, 
chlorine is one away from has seven valence electrons, needs one more. Sodium has one to give, so that's exactly what happens. It 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 kicks out that electron. That's this the reaction we just looked at. Now I don't have this here as a diatomic molecule, right? The other one was listed as Cl2. Uh, just for clarity here, right? So that electron transfers to has an electron, it's transferred to the chlorine, it becomes cationic because it's the proton doesn't leave, the electron leaves, therefore their charge from the nucleus is, is now exposed. You have a plus charge. Chlorine turns into chloride, negatively charged, and so you get these cations. And then, then these are noble gas-like. They have noble, ga noble gas configuration. They are not noble gases, but their electronic configuration is similar to that of noble gases. And so atoms want the same electron configuration as the nearest noble gas. That's what bonding is all about. And in this case, this is done by transferring the electron from an electropositive element. And then what happens is these cations and anions, they form crystal lattices. They have, and so what you now have is you have these spheres of plus and minus, so you get these layers, you get plus and minus sticking together like that, and so you form these layers. And uh, anyway, so this goes in, in three dimensions, and then they are stacked on top of each other, which is which is which is kind of shown here. It's, it's harder to see, so, but it's in this case you actually have a cube, right? You see that cube here, and so then the atoms are are perfectly ordered here. They all are at 90 degree angles. And, and so there's an electrostatic interaction here. But this this compound for uh, this compound this uh, lecture focuses on ionic, I mean covalent compounds. Okay. So the characters just of uh, characteristics of ionic solids, right? They're they're high melting, which is what we saw earlier. Uh, very low electrical conductivity. As, as, if, if the electrons are not mobile, they're, they're, if it's a solid, you don't have mobility, so you can. It's there's no electrical conductivity, and and brittle. They usually are somewhat brittle, right? You can crush sodium chloride with a spoon. It's not like diamond. You can't crush diamond with a spoon. So diamond is a covalent compound, or so it's it's a different. Uh, it doesn't really quite fit in there because it's just made up of carbon. So, but it's. Uh, it's not ionic in uh, any way, and so. Uh, but most ionic compounds are also soluble in polar solvents, which is for us basically water. Okay, just a little summary here. Uh, ionic bonds again is a chemical bond electrostatic interaction right you got these it's like mini magnets sticking together it's an electrostatic interaction and this is not sodium metal and chlorine it's just it's just here uh, sodium ions and chloride ions combining to form sodium chloride here cations vocabulary and ions positively charged particles negatively charged particles form together to make ionic compounds here Okay, we can also instead of writing the electronic configurations and saying, oh, okay, so sodium is neon 3s1 and, and, and chlorine is 3s2 2p5, we can take those valence electrons and, and draw them around the atom symbol, and that's called the Lewis dot symbol. And, and so that's going to come in very useful, right? So. So then sodium, which is in the first group, will have a single dot on its outer shell. And then you can easily see how that, tra how that will transfer and how this will be in a one-to-one -one ratio. And so that's pretty simple. And so everything in that first group in the alkaline metals, you have uh, lithium, sodium, potassium. They all have the same Lewis dot symbol, really not the same symbol. It's a different symbol, but the same a single dot, potassium. Lithium, lithium has a single dot, right? And then you just put the valence electrons around the symbol. So something like magnesium then, right, which is in the second group and has a, a, an electron configuration of neon and then 3s2, you would put 
two electrons, right? And you're supposed to spread them out just like you would with Hund's rule, right? So if you get to carbon, carbon has four, you would put them one, two, three, four around it. And then, yeah, a few, and then you can pair them up once you have, go to phosphorus, which has five. You could do one, two, three, four, and then you pair them up. But, but it's not all that important for the Lewis dot symbols to be consistent with that. You, and uh, but but once you've make your bond, you, it becomes perfectly clear. This is in a perfect one to one ratio. Sodium has one to spare. Chlorine needs one, and so we've got cations and anions that bind together. Let's practice drawing some of these Lewis dot structures. What you need to do is is take out the periodic table, go find sodium. Sodium has the symbol Na, and we already did this, so Na with a single dot. Going over to calcium, calcium has the symbol Ca, go find it, it is in group 2. Group 2 will then have two dots around it. Bromine is in group 7 under chlorine. That means group 7 means 7 valence electrons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Sulfur is in group 6. It has the symbol S. Group 6 means 6 valence electrons. 4, 5, and then 6. Beryllium is in group 2. It is BE. We stick both of those here. And I don't care if you want to put them next to each other. Not, not paired up, but that's fine. Nitrogen has 5 valence electrons. has a symbol N. 2, 3, 4, and 5. Aluminum is AL. It is in group 3 under boron, 1, 2, and 3 valence electrons. Potassium, we already drew, it's in group 1. And those are the Lewis dot symbols, okay? Uh, then, so these are the, the ones that, are in, in, uh, that we just drew, okay? And so then by looking at them, you can predict what they need to do to engage in bonding, right? So bromine needs to pick up one electron here, right? So it picked up one electron, which means it picks up a charge. Move on to sulfur, just just to stick with anions here. See here you have you need to you have two gaps, so you need to pick up two electrons. And I should have really made them excess, but if it picks up two electrons, it's going to gain two negative charges and be overall minus two. Okay, of course, this is just for ionic bonding, right? Calcium, and here I am 23 minutes later still talking about ionic compounds in a chapter that's called covalent compounds, right, or molecular compounds. Calcium is a metal, right? Calcium has two valence electrons. It's going to get rid of them, so let's remove them. But then when you remove negative charges, you end up with a residual plus two charge, right? Same with beryllium, same group. Remove those two electrons. Aluminum has three electrons. It's a metal, and that's how you know. It's a metal, so you remove it. Plus three, then. Nitrogen needs, has one, two, three missing. Nitrogen is three away. It needs to pick up three more, so it's going to be a three minus compound. All right? Potassium gets rid of it one electron and and so we're going to take a break this is part one